Hey guys, welcome back to Pop em Up Chem. This video, we're going to be carrying on with Unit 5 looking at Hess's Law. So, we're firstly going to define Hess's Law and link it to being able to calculate the enthalpy change of reaction, and then we're going to do a bit of that calculation ourselves. But first, here's a little question about enthalpy of combustion for you to try. Pause the video and have a go. So you'll remember that in a calorimetry experiment, we're going to be heating up some water in a calorimeter, the container of the water, and measuring the heat change as we add energy from a fuel underneath. Now, of course, when we set something on fire, most of the heat goes upwards. However, we can't control heat coming out in all different directions and heat lost from the calorimeter as well, no matter how good our draft excluders. So heat loss will be our main source of error. Turning our attention to Hess's law, which is actually quite simple, but has some quite profound implications. The enthalpy change of a reaction is independent of the route that the reaction takes. So what does that mean? Well, if we take a reaction, for example, A plus B goes to C to D, while E and F is known to be formed from A and B and also forms C and D, so we end up with this kind of cycle, we know that delta H1, 2 and 3 are all related. In this case, we could say that delta H1 is equal to delta H2 plus delta H3. And we know that because if we go from A plus B, we follow the arrow through delta H2 to E and F and up from delta H3 to C and D, we see that that pathway is going to be equal to delta H1. And this kind of functions as a visual representation of that statement that the enthalpy change of reaction is independent of the pathway. For example, what if E plus F actually didn't make C and D and instead C plus D made E and F? Well, we would switch the arrow like this, but that would change the overall relationship Following that same pathway, we would now get delta H1 is equal to delta H2 minus delta H3 as we have to go against the arrow. So we can see the relationship between all these enthalpy changes. Now this is useful because it's not always possible to measure some enthalpy changes directly and so that we can use this to be able to calculate ones that we're not able to measure. And we need to be able to draw thermochemical cycles. Now, all thermochemical cycles are other things I've previously used to describe the different routes that a reaction could take. So let's take this example of NO2 going to nitrogen and oxygen. Well, NO2 can also undergo another reaction where we form NO gas and oxygen alongside that. And then that can further react to form the nitrogen and the oxygen gas by itself. So if we want to find delta HR, we need to know the enthalpy of reactions of the two others. So if the breakdown over here is 114.4 kilojoules per mole and the enthalpy of reaction over here on the right is minus 180.8 kilojoules per mole, then we're going to be able to use that to calculate the enthalpy of reaction of the top reaction because we know that the enthalpy change of a reaction is independent of the pathway we can simply do delta hr is equal to delta hr kind of prime on the left hand side plus delta hr double prime on the right hand side which is plus 114.4 minus 180.8 which gives us minus 66.4 kilojoules per mole so that's how we can use thermochemical cycles to work out the enthalpy change of a reaction. So there are two main situations in which you will actually have to draw out the thermochemical cycles, and that will either be using enthalpy of formation values or enthalpy of combustion values. And it's really key that we get the arrows in these cycles in the correct positions so that when we do our calculations, we get the right signs on all of our numbers. So using enthalpies of formation values first, let's see if we can calculate the enthalpy change of this reaction here. 
So remember, enthalpy of formation values tell us the enthalpy change when one mole of a molecule is formed from its elements in standard conditions. So we know if we've been given formation values that the reactants of a formation value must be the elements that are contained in the molecule. So we can say for this, we take all the elements that are present in either side of the equation, they're both going to be the same because it's balanced. So that's carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen and oxygen. Remembering that nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen will all be diatomic as they're non-metal gases that are noble gases. And then we just balance it to how many is present, which is 4, 9, 12 and 10 respectively. So we now know these are the elements that make the reactants and the products of the reaction at the top. And because we've got formation values, we know that the enthalpy values we're given are for the conversion of these elements into those molecules. So we know whenever we're using formation values that the arrows will go up from the elements that are at the bottom. And now we've completed a thermochemical cycle, we're able to calculate this value of delta H. We know that this value, due to Hess's law, is going to be equal to the route that is taken by going in the direction of this red arrow. So if we label the process on the left delta H prime and the process on the right delta H double prime, then we can write an expression for the overall delta H, which is going to be equal to negative delta H prime plus delta H double prime. The reason it's negative delta H prime, remember, is because we're going against that first arrow to follow that route. So now that we have an expression, we just need to calculate the actual values of delta H prime and delta H double prime and then plug them into that overall expression. So we've got our enthalpies of formation values here. In exam questions, they'll often refer you to table 12 of the data booklet. So we can see that we've got four moles of the first compound. So we multiply four by 54 and add five times the second compound, which is minus 20, which gives us an overall enthalpy of delta H prime of plus 116 kilojoules per mole. We can do the same now with delta H prime. We take four moles of CO2, which is minus 393, 12 moles of H2O, which is minus 286, and nine moles of H2O. However, this is enthalpy of formation values. So by definition, any element has a value of zero. So we just add what we've already got, which leaves us with minus 5,004 kilojoules per mole. Now we can just plug those values into the overall term that we made at the beginning. So we get minus 116 plus minus 5,004, which is equal to minus 5,120 kilojoules per mole, which is the overall enthalpy change for the reaction. Now, if we want to do this using enthalpy of combustion values, then we have a slightly different technique. For example, if we want to find the enthalpy change of reaction for this reaction, which just so happens to be an enthalpy change of formation, and we're using enthalpy of combustion values, we need to consider the definition of enthalpy of combustion first. We know that enthalpy of combustion is the enthalpy change when we react something completely with water to form CO2 and H2O. So the values of the enthalpy of combustion of all of the things we're given here are the values for reacting them with oxygen to form CO2 and H2O, which means that CO2 and H2O are always going to be at the bottom of any thermochemical cycle where we're using enthalpy of combustion. So we can balance those and then we draw our arrows. And here is where mistakes can be made. We just said that the enthalpy change is the reaction of these to form CO2 and H2O. So the arrows go down the way. You can think about this if we build something up, i.e. formation, the arrows go up. If we burn something down, i.e. combustion, the arrows go down. That's a little way that you can remember these. So now that we have a thermochemical cycle, we can use this in a very similar way than as before to calculate the enthalpy change of this reaction. We know that the enthalpy change 
of formation, the top reaction is going to be equal to the pathway taken by this red line. So if we label both of our other reactions as delta H prime and delta H double prime, we can write an expression for this overall reaction. So we know that delta H F is going to be equal to positive delta H prime plus the negative value of delta H double prime. So we do just as we did before, we can now calculate the values of delta H double prime and delta H prime. So for delta H prime, we can see we've got five moles of carbon, which is five times minus three, nine, four, plus six moles of hydrogen, which is six times minus two, eight, four, which gives us minus three, six, eight, six kilojoules per mole for delta H prime. So for delta H double prime, we can see that we've only got one mole of the pentane. So we're going to have minus 3509 kilojoules per mole for delta H double prime. We can then take these two values, input them in the overall expression. So we get delta H F equals minus 3686 minus minus 3509, which is minus 177 kilojoules per mole. Let's get you doing a question like that then. Use this data to construct a thermochemical cycle for this reaction. Pause the video and have a go. Pop them up. So this question gives us enthalpy of formation values, which means we're gonna have our arrows both going up the way with the elements that compose the reactants and the products at the bottom. And we've got delta H prime and delta H double prime as the representations of those two values. So the overall enthalpy change is going to be equal to negative delta H prime plus delta H double prime. And then we're just going to calculate both of those using the values in the box. So our value on the left is going to be minus 635 plus minus 286, which is minus 921 kilojoules per mole. And for delta H double prime, we've just got one mole of the hydroxide, which is minus 986 kilojoules per mole. Plug those values into the overall equation, which gives us delta H equals minus minus 921 plus minus 968, which equals minus 65 kilojoules per mole. Now, we can further extend this to include more reactions. However, we might want to avoid the use of more complicated multi-step reactions in this diagrammatic way. So instead, if we are given multiple equations and the enthalpy change of those equations, we're able to rearrange them to give the delta H of an unknown reaction. And this allows us to avoid more complex processing and actually can speed things up quite a lot. Let's take the example of the reaction of nitrogen with oxygen to form N2O5. Now, if we want to find the enthalpy change of this reaction, we're going to need some other reactions that we can rearrange to give this overall reaction. So let's say we know or we're given three other equations and their enthalpy changes. The reaction for the formation of water, its enthalpy change, the reaction of N2O5 with water to form HNO3 nitric acid, that's enthalpy change, and we're given the reaction of nitrogen with oxygen and hydrogen to form HNO3 also. So if we label these three equations kind of A, B, and C, that will help us better illustrate what we're going to do. So the first thing I'm gonna do is we're gonna follow a rule of scarcity. So I'm going to look for components of an equation in A, B, or C that only exist in either A, B, or C and also exist in the top. So the example I've picked first is the N2O5. That is only in equation B and in the top equation. What I need to do now is I then need to rearrange or reorient the equation with the same number of moles and in the same orientation as the top equation. So we can see in the top equation, N2O5 is on the right hand side and in B it's on the left hand side. So the first thing we're going to need to do is I'm going to need to multiply it 
by minus one, I'm going to flip the equation effectively, but also I'm gonna to need to double the equation to get two moles of N2O5. Now I'm not gonna worry about the others just yet. I'm going to follow my rule of scarcity for the other components, and then we'll cancel them all out at the end. So I'm not going to look at oxygen next because I can see oxygen exists in two equations, both C and A, and that makes it a bit more complicated. So I'm going to focus on N2 first. So there's two moles of N2 in the top and we can see there's one mole of it in C. So here I'm going to need to multiply C by two. And again, I'm not going to worry about any other components just yet, just going to focus on that overall equation. Lastly, I'm going to need to account for the oxygen. Now oxygen, I left because oxygen wasn't scarce. Oxygen existed in multiple different equations. As you can see, it's already in C. So I already have six moles of oxygen. So what I need to do next is I need to remove one mole of oxygen. So if we want to remove one, we look to the other side of the equation. So I need to have oxygen on the other side, one mole of oxygen on the other side. So I'm going to multiply the first equation by minus one. I'm gonna flip it and then I'm gonna double it. So I get minus two B plus two C minus two A. And then I can add all of those respective enthalpy changes together, which gives me an overall of 29. And then we can look at the equations and we can make sure that we've got the correct overall equation. So if something is on the same side of the equation, then we add them together. And if something are on opposite sides, then we cancel them out. So we can see we've got 4HNO3 on the left-hand side of the top, the top equation, minus 2B, and on the right-hand side of 2C, so they cancel out. We can see that we've got 2H2O on opposite sides of minus 2A and minus 2B, as well as two hydrogens on opposite sides of 2C and minus 2A. Oxygen, we can see we have six on the left-hand side of 2C and one on the right-hand side of minus 2A, so they cancel to give us an overall 5O2 on the left-hand side, which leaves us with an overall equation of 2N2 plus 5O2 goes to 2N2O5, which is exactly the same reaction at the top, so we know we've done this correctly. So the summary here is we can use the overall equation to match the reactants and products of the equations that we have known enthalpy changes for, and we add what's on the same side, cancel what is on opposite sides, and then we're able to determine the overall enthalpy of the reaction, and we can even double check that we've got it right by giving ourselves the overall equation at the end. Time for you to do a couple of questions on this then. First question, find the overall enthalpy change for the bold reaction given these two reactions. Pause the video to have a go. Pop em up. So if we label the equations A and B, we can see that equation A has four times as many PCL3 moles as we would like it, although it is the right way round. So we're gonna do A over four, which is gonna equal a quarter P4. 3 over 2 Cl2 equals P Cl3. So the enthalpy change is going to be minus 2439 over 4, which is minus 609.75 kilojoules. With B, we're going to divide it by 4 because we want just one mole of PCl5. So we're doing the same thing all over again. So we get PCl5 goes to a quarter P4 plus 5 over 2 Cl. The enthalpy change being 3438 over 4, which is 859.5 kilojoules. So now we want to find the overall enthalpy change, which is going to be 859.5 minus 609.75, which is 249.75 kilojoules. We can cancel out things that appear on opposite sides of the equation and then we can write out the overall equation which just so happens to be the bold equation at the top so we can be pretty sure we've done this one correctly have another go a slightly more difficult one this for the reaction of carbon dioxide with water 
pause the video to have a go. Pop them up, following the same system I did before, labeling A, B and C, I'm going to look for C2, H2 first. So I can see I'm going to need to flip A to give me negative A to get C2, H2 on the correct side of the equation to match the overall equation, which gives me 94.5 kilojoules for that. I see CO2 only appears in equation C. Got the right number of moles, but on the wrong side of the equation. So I'm going to need negative C to make sure I have the CO2 on the right side. The enthalpy change for that is going to be plus 283 kilojoules. And I'm going to look at oxygen next. Now I can see I've got 3.5 oxygen on my right of minus C. So I want to get rid of one of those. So I'm going to double equation B and flip it so I can cancel my oxygens in the final equation, which gives me an enthalpy change of negative 142.4. Then I can do my overall calculation, which gives me an overall enthalpy change of 235.1 kilojoules. And I can start cancelling out. So C2H6 cancels out. So does my two hydrogens and one of my moles of oxygen cancels out along with two moles of the water, which gives me two CO2 plus H2O goes to two C2H2 plus 2.502, which is of course the overall equation. Again, confirming that we can be pretty sure about our answer on this one. No practical work to go with this one, but a worksheet to get some good practice going. Thanks again for joining me guys. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon. And as always, practice makes slightly better.